Okay, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I do thank you for your word, and I thank you that your word is truth, and that if we abide in your word, and your word abides in us, then you, we know the truth, and the truth sets us free. So, Father, I thank you for the revelation of your truth tonight, and I ask for you to bring forth it, the word by your anointing, and the anointing that breaks the yoke. I thank you, Father, that you have desired to do this from the beginning of the foundation of the world. So, Lord, we just yield to you. We yield to your anointing and to your spirit. Have your way. Bring forth your truth. Let it be life to our spirit to set the captives free. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Tonight we said uh, we would be looking at Romans chapter 1 in the Bible. And uh, the most significant thing about Romans chapter 1 is that if a person uh, has any kind of little dictionary concordance in the back of their Bible um, and it in the listing of different kinds of topics usually after the word home uh, as in home and family will be the word homosexual or homosexuality and under homosexuality often will be this one scripture Romans chapter 1 and uh, the importance of Romans chapter 1 is that Romans chapter 1 is the only verse in the entire Bible now, do you understand what I'm saying? The only verse in the whole Bible that deals with women being with women. And now, we know already that if you want to make a case about anything, the Bible about itself has already said, out of the word, out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. So in order to make a case about uh, lesbianism or women with women, you have to have more than one witness in the whole Bible. There's, uh, there's another topic in the Bible that you can't make a case about because it's only mentioned once, and that's baptisms for the dead. And uh, you can't make a case about it. You don't know what Paul was talking about when he said baptizing the dead. Uh, you know, why do, he says, why do we, otherwise, why do we baptize for the dead? We don't know what he was talking about. He was talking to the church at Corinth. We don't know what he had in mind. There's no other reference to it in the Bible. So you cannot make a doctrine on that. You can't then, you know, teach and, and preach and you must do this in order to be saved or anything else. You, the Bible itself, by its own standards, says out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every uh, word be established. Now, so there you have the only case of women being talked about in the Bible is in this Romans chapter 1. Again, as I say many times, uh, it will say uh, homosexuality and then it will say Romans 1, uh, 26 and 27, and that to uh, most Bible commentators, remember footnotes are not the inspired word of God. Footnotes are the inspired word of somebody, but not God. And uh, it's just what man thinks, what he's thought, or what she's thought as they've studied and as they've pondered, and this is what they've come up with, but it isn't necessarily anything that came from the Lord or the Holy Spirit. We also know that any good Bible scholar will agree to these facts, that when you study the Bible, you must ask yourself a few questions in order to find out what it is uh, that it, the Bible's talking about. Because the Bible is filled with facts. I will say it this way. Everything in the Bible is truly recorded, but not everything in the Bible is true. Now, isn't that a shocking statement? But let me repeat it. Everything in the Bible is truly recorded, but not everything in the Bible is true. How do I know that? Well, for instance, why we have to ask questions is we have to ask the question, who is the speaker? Sometimes the speaker is Satan. Satan is talking to Jesus, for instance, in Matthew chapter 4. And what Satan says to Jesus is truly recorded. But since Satan is the father of lies, what he's saying is not true. But it's truly recorded. It's recorded truly as he said it. But it is not truth. And so you have to ask yourself, who's, being, who's, being, uh, who's speaking here? For instance, in the book of Job, as you read through the book of Job, Job's friends, his three friends, continue to give him advice again and again and again. And yet, God comes along, and everything that they said is truly recorded, but everything they said is not truth. And God comes along and rebukes them for having spoken ill of God and of, of his servant Job. And uh, 
So, you know, you need to ask yourself, you can't, just because something is in the Bible does not mean that it's something you can live by because it might not be so. It might not be true. You need to ask yourself the question, who is being addressed? And you need to ask, who's the speaker? So you want to know who's speaking here. Is it Satan speaking? Is it God speaking? Is it the Holy Spirit? Is it Jesus? Is it the Pharisees? Is it the Sadducees? You don't want to do what the Pharisees and the Sadducees say to do. You know, they told Jesus to have his disciples shut up. And don't cry, don't let them cry out. What do you think they're doing? And now if you took that and said, well, then that's it. We've got to make a doctrine. We're not allowed to speak. We shouldn't, we shouldn't. You know, you, you, you take things out of context. And that's what people do when they try to make distorted doctrines, is that they take things out of context. So you need to know uh, who's speaking. Otherwise, you don't know what is true. And you cannot take scripture out of context. In other words, if something's in chapter 1 and it's verse 26, what did verse 25, 24, 23, verse 1 have to say? So many times when the Bible is, uh, is speaking, it is very well building a case and it's, uh, you know, following. So many times you've seen in the Bible where the first word in the verse is therefore. Well, therefore means it's attached to what's before it. And you have to look and see, well, what is before it that led them to say, therefore? Because when they're saying, therefore, it means they're making a conclusion based on something that has already been said. Are you with me and you understand what I'm saying? This is very important in, in any kind of Bible exegesis. Anytime we want to study the word, for instance, um, in Matthew 27, verse 5, you don't need to turn there. I'll just tell you what it says because I'm just going to give you an example. Matthew 27, verse 5, it tells us this is true, truly recorded. It says, Judas went out and hung himself. Now, does that make it right? You see, it's truly recorded that Judas went out and hung himself. Now, in Luke chapter 10, verse 37, Jesus says, go and do likewise. Now, I can say that in the Bible it says, and am I right when I say this, Judas went and hung himself, and the Bible says, go and do likewise. Is that true? Does the Bible say those things? Yes, it says those things. But am I taking it out of context? Yes. Because when Jesus said, go and do likewise, he was talking about the Samaritan who found the man who was beaten on his way from, Jericho down to Jer from Jerusalem down to Jericho, who was beaten on the wayside, and the good Samaritan came along and showed him mercy. And it's about giving mercy that Jesus says, go and do likewise. So I'm taking something totally out of context when I take go and do likewise and stick it with Jesus went and hung himself. And yet, people who don't have any idea what the Bible says, I could tell them that the Bible condones suicide by hanging because it says so in the Bible. And I can tell you chapter and verse. And yet, see, what I have done is really an abomination to the word. I have done something totally wrong by taking it out of context. Well, that's exactly what happens. Exactly. That is the process by which people take Romans 1, 26 and 27, pull it totally out of context, leave it unrelated to what went before it and what comes after it as if it's an isolated verse and take that little verse and say, therefore we have proof that God hates lesbianism and homosexuality. Well, you have no proof any more than I have proof to say that God wants you to go hang yourself when in fact what God is saying is hey, you better have some mercy. You see? So to look at this, we're going to first take a look at the scripture in question. So we turn to Ch Romans chapter 1. And we're just going to take these two verses out of context, like everybody else does. We're going to look at these two out of context, see what they say, and see why people say that this is against homosexuals, and therefore God proves that he hates homosexuals in these two verses. Okay. Now look at verse 26, because here's where the story starts in terms of pulling something out of context. It says, I'm reading from King James. Your version will maybe read a little differently, but it'll still start off the same way. Doesn't your verse, start, your, your verse 26 start off by saying something like, therefore? Something like, uh, because of what you've just read. Now you see, right off the bat, you can't start any verse without reading that starts off with therefore, 
King James says, for this cause. You can't read those three words without asking the question, for what cause? For what cause? Obviously, this is very definitely attached to something. And yet, uh, Bible commentary after Bible commentary takes Romans 126 as if it's isolated all by itself. It's the only thing that God had to say. It's not attached to anything else. And, and so uh, they just drop the first three words for this cause and start like the sentence didn't have that in there. And it goes on, for this cause, God gave them up unto vile affections, for even their women did change or exchange the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the women, this is verse 27, burned in their lust, one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error, which is meat, which was meat. Now, they stop with that, but in verse 28, it begins with a, a, a conjunction, the word and, meaning it's attached to what you've just read. There's more to the story than what you've just read. But people who want to make a case out of homosexuals and lesbians being hated by God have to put brackets around these two verses, isolate them, and in order to make any kind of case. Because, uh, because if you dare to look before it and after it, you suddenly discover we're talking about a whole different group of people here. We're not talking about homosexuals at all. Remember I said, we have to ask the question, who's the speaker and who's being addressed? No matter what you're reading in the Bible, because you need to know who is the speaker. Is it Jesus? Is it Paul? Is it Timothy? Is it Satan? Is it a Pharisee? Is it a Sadducee? Who is it? You know, can you trust what they're saying? What, who's speaking here? So in this case, this is the Apostle Paul uh, writing. Who's he writing to? He's writing to the Christian church at Rome. Now, when he's writing to the Christian church at Rome, is he writing to the, uh, the gay metropolitan uh, uh, church, uh, the gay uh, big city church in, uh, in Rome? Is this a bunch of gay Christians that he's writing to? Is this, in fact, is he writing to a gay social organization? If he is, he might be addressing homosexuality. But he's not. He's addressing the church. And if we really look at this passage, it doesn't take too much uh, ingenuity to figure out he's addressing not homosexuals, he's addressing heterosexuals. And the heterosexuals in this passage, he's addressing, he's making some assumptions, some things that they should uh, be able to agree with him about. So we pick up here, and there are some words that I want us to look at in uh, Strong's Concordance. We've already described what Strong's Concordance is and the numbers in Strong's. So we pick up with verse 26, and we're going to look at uh, Strong's. Uh, it says, for this cause, we haven't looked at the cause yet. We don't know what this cause is. We'll see that later. For this cause, God gave them up unto vile affections, for even their women, even their women, changed or did change or exchanged the natural use. Now I want to stop there. So the women did change the natural use. The word changed is 3337 in Strong's. It means exchanged. Now the women exchanged something. Now what they've exchanged, the word exchanged, what does the word exchanged mean? If I say I'm going to exchange this shirt, what does it mean? It means I have a shirt to begin with. And the shirt that I have, I'm going to trade in, give it up, get rid of it, and get, pick up something different, another shirt, for instance. Or I'm going to exchange this piece of luggage for another piece of luggage. I'm going to exchange this for that, whatever it is. But to exchange anything, I have to have something to exchange. Isn't that correct? So it says they exchanged the natural use. Now the word natural, is the word 5446 in Strong's, and it means instinctive. So what they are exchanging is their instinctive use. In other words, a heterosexual woman, her basic instinct is to have sexual uh, relationships with a heterosexual man. That's her instinct. When she's born, uh, from the time she's a little girl, she thinks about boyfriends and husbands and uh, playing house and playing mommy 
That's her instinct. You look at her childhood to find out her instinct, to find out what's ingrained in her. Now, if a non-heterosexual woman is going to exchange what's natural or what's instinctive, it means that she would have to exchange what is natural to her, what's instinctive in her, for that which is not natural and what is not instinctive in her. Isn't that correct? In order to follow what's being said here, right here in, in the Bible. So these women did exchange the natural use into that which is uh, against nature or that which is against their own nature. They exchanged it, okay? So they exchanged their heterosexual orientation for homosexual activity. Not necessarily for homosexual orientation, but they exchanged their orientation, what was instinctive to them, for certain sexual behavior, okay? And likewise, we know that because verse 27 says likewise, in other words, it means the men are doing the very same thing. So if likewise means, the, you know what likewise means, it means it's just like this. So we've seen something about the women, and now we're going to look at something about the men, but what we look about the, at about the men is the exact same thing about the women, so what we can infer about the men, we can certainly infer about the women, because it's the same word here, likewise. Likewise, the men leaving the natural use, okay? Again, is this word natural or instinctive? In other words, their own instinctive use of the woman. So. Which man has an instinctive use of a woman? A heterosexual man or a homosexual man? A heterosexual man. A heterosexual man has a natural instinctive use of woman. Isn't that correct? So he leaves that. Now what's the word leave? You see? To leave it is the same kind of concept there as exchange. Um, it's not 3337. Uh, changed or exchanged, but it's the very same uh, concept. It's 863 in Strong's, which I don't have listed on the overhead, but it's the same concept. It means having forsaken to send away, okay, leaving the natural use to send away the natural use, to forsake the natural use, their instinctive use, to lay aside their natural use, to leave their natural use, or to yield up their natural use of the woman. They burned, burned is 1572 in Strong's in their lust. 1572 in Strong's means to inflame deeply. In fact, when you look this word up in Strong's or if you look it up in the New Englishman's Concordance, you discover that there are other words for burned. There are other words to inflame. The difference between those words and this word is that this word has got just a little clarifier on the beginning of it a little prefix that, that, that explains it is not just a fire, but it is an absolute all-consuming um, kind of uh, inflammation that goes deep within. In other words, it's just a, it consumes the person. They're absolutely consumed. The only thing I can think of is uh, when a person is being burned or inflamed deeply in their lust, it's really more we're talking about the point of orgasm, the point of, you know, where there's just no turning back, the point where it doesn't matter now what God says. You just are not going to turn back. You're just too far deep into the thing that you're not, uh, you're not willing to listen anymore. Uh, that's the word there. We're talking about being burned in their lust. The word lust is interesting because here Paul says they're burning in lust. And, of course, the word lust is, is as we would expect it to be. It means lust or desire or craving. And they're just burning in this craving. So it does, not mean, it does not say, for instance, you know, there are many things that it could say. It is not saying they burned in their love. It doesn't say love. We're talking about raw sexual lust. Raw just absolute activity, lustful activity for the sake of activity. You might think in terms of uh, male hustlers, for instance, whose natural instinct might be for women. 
but th in order to make a couple of bucks or whatever they want to do to buy their drugs or whatever is their own personal situation. Uh, and they get to the point in lust uh, where there's no turning back and for they're burning in that lust deeply uh, because they're just at the very point of, not, of no return. There you have that moment. Now, what does that have to do with a gay couple who have made a lifetime commitment of love to honor, to cherish, till death do us part? What has that got to do with these, those people? But in nothing, because in a gay coupled relationship, neither of them have exchanged their instinct for anything else. They've not given up what's instinctive or natural to them to exchange it for something. Now, I have known women in the past who have uh, been in a lesbian relationship who in that coupled relationship, one woman, uh, I remember one woman back in the 70s who always said to me, and she was bragging about it, thought it was uh, quite, she thought it was uh, quite exciting or acceptable or whatever, but she said, um, she always would say about her spouse and to her spouse simultaneously, she'd always say, well, my spouse used to be with a man before she met me. And she'd say, and we, uh, we know she is straight, aren't you, honey? Aren't you a heterosexual? And you'd always said that if you ever left me, you'd always go back to a man. Didn't you always say that? And the other one would say, well, that's right. That's right. And guess what happened? One day they broke up, and where do you think that woman went? She went right back to a man. So she did exchange that which was natural for her and was in that relationship for a number of years. And I, you know, I don't judge it. I don't know, you know what kind of abusive situation she was in with her former husband that made her decide she didn't care. She wasn't interested in being with another man. She didn't want to be with a man, uh, you know, whatever it was. But her heart was not really geared toward her woman. So she exchanged something that didn't belong to her and then went back to what did belong to her. She did go back to what was natural for her. So we, the, the question here is, are people leaving what's natural? The other question is, are they burning in lust or are they walking in love? Because God is love. So love comes from God because Satan certainly doesn't have any love. Satan can't inspire love. Certainly he can't uh, uh, establish a love relationship. He doesn't have any love. So for people to condemn a gay relationship as if it was wrong and immoral and God hates it and God will condemn it uh, is certainly to have no concept of where love comes from. You have to ask yourself, is this a lustful relationship? And, and a lustful relationship is a relationship in which the only thing that matters is sex. The only thing that matters. And if you're burning and flaming deeply in lust, the only thing that matters is the sexual activity. You could care less. You don't need to know the name of the person. In fact, once the sex act is consummated, you might get their phone number on a, on a matchbook cover uh, so that you might call them again because you enjoyed sex with them. You might want to know who they are. You might find out their name later. It might be a, a momentary thing. It just happened that quick. And uh, that kind of stuff happens all the time because people are getting picked up uh, and thrown in jail for public sexual activity in America uh, all the time for that sort of thing. Also in prisons, people who have a natural instinct toward the opposite sex will exchange that for the sake of raw sex while they're in that prison situation in order to have sex and then uh, once they're released from prison they're not looking for a male lover and there isn't any love in that relationship many times it's just lust raw pure lust burning now now that is all we can gather from those two verses that we're talking about lust just reading the Bible here just simply reading what the Bible says um, now, we have not yet even addressed well, for what cause are they even doing this? And it's there. And we have not even addressed after we see that they have this sexual kind of lustful activity, what else occurs? And that's also there. So by the time we really begin to look at this passage, uh, we begin to see, you know, who's God talking about 
What is God trying to say in this particular situation? You know, you might want to ask yourself, how does this heterosexual person get to the place that they're having raw, lustful, homosexual sexual activity? That's a good question. I think that's a good, fair question. And yet it does occur. It does certainly occur, not only in America, but throughout the earth. And uh, so we're going to have to go back a few verses in this chapter. Uh, Romans chapter 1, of course, is the first chapter of the book of Romans. And Paul's uh, addressing the church. He begins by giving greeting to the church, saying who it is that's writing, uh, why he's writing, uh, giving them a greeting in the name of the Lord, uh, establishing his apostleship, uh, talking about how faith helps, about the gospel itself, that he's not ashamed of the gospel, uh, that the gospel is salvation it's the power of God verse 16 says for salvation to everyone that believes to the Jew and also to the Greek and that verse 17 says the just or the righteous shall live by faith okay so he establishes that then we pick up with verse 18 so the first 17 verses really are talking to the church establishing a little bit of doctrine then he's going to begin to talk about the thing that gets us to verse 26 and verse 27. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness. So we start off, we realize now, what is he talking about? He's talking about ungodliness, people who are not walking in a godly way. So he's talking about all ungodliness, all unrighteousness of mortals, men, in uh, King James 444 and Strong's Anthropos. So it's not just male humans, but female humans also. Unrighteous human beings, ungodly human beings who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which may be known of God is m obvious, manifest in them. For God has shown it unto them. So we have to stop there and say, well, what has this said to us so far? So far we see that these people are walking in all ungodliness, all unrighteousness. However, verse 19 shows, God has shown them godliness and righteousness. You see that in verse 19? God has shown it to them. So here's people who've heard the word. Here's people who've received the witness. Here's people who've heard the gospel. Here's people who've heard the good news. In fact, in the first century, when he's writing to the church at Rome, the gospel did not come apart from the power and miracle gifts of the Holy Spirit. The church was established on God's calling card, which was miracle signs and wonders. So when he's talking about people who would have known because it was made obvious in them, you're looking at people who probably uh, needed a healing touch from God and were healed. People who may have uh, had some kind of physical ailment, blindness, deafness, whatever, some kind of impediment, and God healed them. It was made manifest. The power of God was made manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. So here's someone who's really had a touch from God. Now they should know God's real. Correct? I mean, you would think if you had a terminal disease and all of a sudden you don't have that anymore. God has absolutely healed you. You were born blind and now you can see. You couldn't hear a thing and now you can hear everything. You could never speak but now you can speak plainly. God has moved by the power of the gospel of the good news of Jesus Christ and you're saved, you're changed. So God's revealed it. He's made it manifest in them, within them. Okay, so they've got good reason to understand Jesus. There is really no excuse. And it goes on to say, For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. So the Bible's talking about people who have absolutely no excuse. We're not talking about heathens in uh, you know, some uh, uh, country where the gospel is forbidden to be preached and, and people never have even seen a Bible. Or We're talking about people who've been re released from demonic oppression or people who are absolutely without excuse. No excuse because the power has been revealed to them. And then it says, but because that when they knew God, which implies that they did know God. When they knew God, 
So you have to see that the person being talked about here is somebody who absolutely knows God. It doesn't say when they knew about God. It says when they knew God. There's a world of difference between knowing about me and knowing me. If you know me, you know things about me. You know who I am. You know my name. You know where I live. You know what I like. You've eaten dinner with me. You've sat down and communed with me. And they are without excuse because they knew God, but they glorified him not as God. In other words, a person who gets a miracle in their life and says, that's great. There were, does that happen in the Bible? Yes, there were 10 lepers, if you remember. Nine of them never came back to say thank you. But one of them, who was a Samaritan, came back to say thank you. And Jesus said to that one, you've been made whole. The nine others never came back to say thank you. And there are millions of people in the world that God has changed, that God has delivered, that God has healed, that God has made whole, that God has... Somebody's prayed for them and God has released them from demonic oppression. Their life has been changed. Their bankruptcy has been reversed. Their finances have been blessed. God has done a miracle in their life and they can attest to the fact that God's power is alive, but they never glorify him as God. Okay, that's the person we're beginning to look at. Okay, neither were thankful. They weren't even thankful. They couldn't come back and say, thank you, Father. Couldn't do it. Wouldn't bother. But became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. And now here's that word again. Remember how we looked at the word changed? And they changed or exchanged the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man, to birds, to four-footed beasts, and creeping things. I'll say that again. We're looking at verse 23. These people changed or they exchanged the glory of God into an image made like to corruptible man, to birds, four-footed beasts, and creeping things. Now, we already know that in Rome there were 420 different temples, each to a different god or goddess, and they were different gods and goddesses that had different likenesses. Some were uh, winged horses. Some were unicorns. Some were, uh, you know, uh, centaurs, people who are half man and half, uh, uh, you know, beast, ox or whatever. And some mermaid, you know, and half woman and half fish. You know, different kinds of things that, that uh, in Greek mythology, these kinds of uh, images that they would bow down to, they would worship, they would, uh, it says here, images that were four-footed beasts, creeping things to birds. So they, instead of giving the glory to God, which they knew belonged to God, they changed the glory and gave the glory to their image. Now, people have done that for centuries. They've done that even in the days of the Exodus, when Moses was on the mountain with the Lord, the people of God asked Aaron to make them an idol. And he made them an idol out of their earrings, out of their gold, and they lifted it up and they began to bow down to that image and say, this is the God that delivered us from Pharaoh. They exchanged the glory of God that was due him for, to the glory of an image. People have done it for centuries. They've done it today. They still do it. Only today... Instead of bowing down to an image, we might bow down to our education and to our paycheck and to our job. And we give our glory to our own self. And we give our glory to, you know, our own ability. We make the image becomes us many times in America, in this culture, in this society. But in other cultures and societies, they still have images. They still carve out uh, totem poles and other things that they bow down to and say, well, that was what did it. That's what got us out of that pickle. That's what... That's what uh, made the tornado go in another direction. That's what saved our little island from the hurricane. And they bow down to the sun god, to the wind god, to the moon god. Still happens in the earth today. And yet they should know better. Wherefore, verse 24 says, God gave them up. In other words, God got fed up. And you know how merciful God is? 
and how loving God is, it takes quite a bit before God finally removes his hands. I mean, people sin and they 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 sin, and God still is reaching out and reaching out and reaching out and reaching out. How many times has he forgiven you? I don't think you could count as a Christian how many times he's forgiven you. So you can see how desperate they've become in their idol worship that God gives them up, hands off. All right, that's what you want, that's it. And these are the people now that God is speaking to. So these people have already, you see, we don't just pick up with verse 26 where somehow out of the clear blue, they just imagine, well, gee, wouldn't it be fun to have sexual activity with the same sex today for something different to do? They started off by exchanging their worship. They started off by exchanging their God, the real God and the knowledge of God for their own imagination and some kind of image. Idolatry is at the core of the whole issue. Idolatry. So we're not, who are we addressing? We're not addressing homosexuals. We are addressing idolaters who have made a deliberate decision with the full knowledge of who God is, without excuse, have decided nonetheless to worship something other than Jesus Christ. Now that's a pretty desperate lot of people. So, therefore God gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts. So now, whatever their heart is deciding to do, it's not listening to God because God's not speaking to them. So the only one they're going to listen to is the lust in their own heart. Lust, not love. In their own heart, they'll dishonor their own bodies between themselves. You know, I mean, I'm not in that scene, and I'm not in that world, and I'm not in that sphere, but I do remember in the 70s there used to be newspapers for married couples, and they would put in ads in newspapers looking for other married couples, or husband and wife seeks woman, uh, bisexual woman, husband and wife seeks man uh, for good times, etc., etc. Well, what do you think they were doing? Dishonoring their relationship, dishonoring their bodies, um, were they worshiping and walking in love and walking in love with God? No, absolutely not. They were doing whatever their own lust decided they wanted to do. I mean, if those magazines and papers are out there today, I really don't know because I don't go anywhere to look for them. But I imagine they're still there because I don't think the human race has gotten cleaner and better and purer since the 70s. I think they've gotten more depraved and, and uh, you know, more idolatrous since those days. So um, these things are not isolated to the first century in Rome. But they occur. So they decided to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. Now comes verse 25. They changed, or there's that word again, 3337 in Strong's. They changed or they exchanged the truth of God into a lie. Now watch this carefully. They've ex watched this very carefully. Watch this wording in the Bible. They've exchanged the truth of God into a lie. Who's the father of lies? Satan. So who are they now listening to? Satan. They are not listening to God the Father. He's given up on them. He's removed his hands from them. So now they're not having anything to do with truth. Now they have everything to do with the father of lies. Now we're getting to a pretty depraved people who are now not only, if they're not only demonic oppressed, they're probably becoming demonic possessed. Okay? And they worship and they serve the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Now, I think this is intriguing because it does not say that they do not worship or serve the creator at all. It says that they worship their idol. They worship and serve the creature more than the creator. So in other words, if you caught this person on the street and you'd say, well, hey, are you a believer in God and do you serve God and worship God? Their answer would be yes. Yes. But they don't worship and serve the, cre the creator more than anything else. 
And what does the Bible say? The Bible says that thou shalt love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, all your strength. They don't do that. They worship what they want to, and once in a while they give God a little recognition. Once in a while they say, oh yeah, I'm a good person, I'm going to heaven. And by the way, I'm not hurting anybody, so what difference does it make? Never heard any statement like that before? I'm a good person, I'll make it. But they're not making it. God's hand is off of them. So now we've got a person who's exchanged several things, and they're used to this process now of taking what's right and getting rid of it and taking what's wrong and living with that. They're used to getting rid of God in their life, which they have no excuse for. They do know God. They knew God. They got rid of God, took a lie, got rid of the truth, took a lie, got rid of God, took the creature, began to serve that. They exchanged the glory of God, gave it to an idol. Now here is the person. Now what we're seeing is depravity going down the tubes. Now comes verse 26. For this cause, for what cause? God hates homosexuals, that's for what cause. No, we're not talking about a homosexual. We're talking about God having given people up because they gave up God. And for this cause, God gave them up unto vile affection, and now even their women have exchanged what was instinctive for them for that which is against their own nature. Well, I guess so. You just keep going further and further down the tubes, walking hand in hand in the pathway of life with Satan, and he'll take you down the tubes. He'll take you anywhere you want to. Likewise, the men, leaving their instinctive use of the women, burned in their lust. Well, who are they walking with when they're burning, absolutely inflamed with this passionate lust? Who are they walking with? Jesus? I don't think so. But they are walking with someone. So there they are, demon oppressed or demon possessed, walking in passionate lust with, toward one another, men with men, working that which is unseemly and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was due them, which was meat. Now, verse 28 picks up and it continues. We haven't finished with these people. They didn't get to the point where now they're having uh, sexual activity that is unnatural to them. And that's where it stops. I'm sorry, we've not finished that passage. We've got to go on. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. What does that say? They don't like to retain God. See, God's still there working with them, but they don't want to retain him. What does it mean to retain God? To still keep him? They don't want to keep him still. They don't want to. They enjoy Satan more than Jesus. And so it says, they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, so God gave them over to a reprobate mind. Now that's an intriguing word, right? A reprobate mind is 96 in Strong's, reprobate and it means an unapproved an unworthy a void of judgment or an undiscerning mind I'll say that again reprobate if you want to just look it up later you could write 96 in Strong's it's unapproved so you can see they have an unapproved mind they have an unworthy mind unworthy for what for someone who's experienced God in the way that they've experienced God this is unworthy of them and it's certainly unworthy of God, and they have exchanged God's glory and given it to other things. Unworthy mind, a void of judgment mind. In other words, the judgments that they make are wrong, empty of any discernment at all, undiscerning. So they have a reprobate mind, in other words, an undiscerning mind, to do the things which are not convenient or those things which are really wrong. Now look at verse 29. We are still dealing with the same group of people. Being filled. What does it mean to be filled? Can people be filled with the Holy Spirit? 
Can they be? Yes. Look at what these people are filled with. Being filled with all unrighteousness. All unrighteousness. How much unrighteousness are they filled with? All of it. All of it. Does that mean then, can you see that this person doesn't walk with God? They have no room in their life for God because they are filled with all unrighteousness. And this word all in the sentence construction of this verse goes on to tell us that everything else that we see that's listed after this, this every adjective, every descriptive word here is coupled with the word all. Okay? So if they're filled with all unrighteousness, follow along with me, they are also filled with all fornication. No wonder they will exchange raw sex and raw lust because they're filled with all fornication. In other words, they'll now have sex with anything that moves that says yes. Maybe it doesn't have to move. And maybe it doesn't have to say yes. They are filled with all fornication. Isn't that true? That's what that's saying. And they are filled with all wickedness. Now, are we talking about a born-again, spirit-filled gay Christian? Well, absolutely not, because you can't be born-again, spirit-filled and gay and be filled with all fornication at the same time. Now, you can be gay and spirit-filled and born again, because many people are. Many, many, many thousands and thousands are. But to be filled with all unrighteousness, all fornication, all wickedness, you're not a born-again believer. Where do you think your destiny is headed? You're on your way to hell is where you're going. Now we look at, they are filled with all covetousness. They'll steal you blind if they get a chance because they want what you've got. They are filled with all maliciousness. Now here's a peop people who are so malicious, malicious. You realize how desperate that word is? And they are filled with all maliciousness. That's not the person you want for your neighbor. Not the person you want to be around. They are filled, they are full of envy, full of murder. Pretty desperate lot here. They'll kill you just to have sex with you or to rob you and to get what you've got. And we're not talking about a gay couple who's in love and walking in Jesus, born again and spirit-filled. We're not. But you either take what the Bible says in its entirety or you don't take any of it. You don't pull out verse 26 and verse 27 and say, God hates homosexuals. You look at who is it that God hates. He hates idolaters who knew better, who threw him away, wouldn't have anything to do with him, pushed, him, pushed God out of their life and began to go down the tubes in their thinking because they began to grab a hold of Satan and walk with him. And they, in fact, didn't even want to retain God in their knowledge and they wanted to retain Satan. And Satan certainly took advantage of the situation and filled them. Therefore, they are filled with all that Satan has to offer, all that he has to offer. They are filled with all wickedness. Who is the epitome of all wickedness? Satan. And they are filled with all wickedness. They're filled with Satan now. From a person who could have been spirit-filled, from a person who has seen the power of God and has no excuse and chose Satan instead. Now we see who we're talking about. Now we see that's not all. We could stop and say they're full of murder and we could stop there and say, hey, now we don't need to look at anything more. Once you see a person who will just shoot down in cold blood anybody because they're filled with murder. We could stop there and say, you don't need to look any further. Honey, the list hasn't stopped. They, it hasn't stopped. They are so full of Satan that they're not, they hasn't stopped there. They're full of all murder. They're full of all debate. You look at them crosswise and they'll start an argument with you just for the sake of all arguing. Debate. All filled with all debate. Filled with all deceit. You can't trust a thing they say because they can't tell the truth. Filled with all malignity. Whisperers. Backbiters. Haters of God. In fact, it wasn't uh, 
too long after I got saved that my pastor shared with me that this was the very passage that proved to him this was the passage. The funny thing is this is the passage that that Bibles try to say proves that God hates homosexuals and my pastor said that this was the passage that proved that God didn't hate homosexuals because he was against these people. These people are haters of God. It's spirit filled, tongue talking, Holy Ghost filled, believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, born again gay and walking in love with their spouse. Is that who is a hater of God? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. These people are not, this, not even agnostics. We're not even looking at a person who wonders if God's real or not. Not even the person who, who, you know, had a miracle in their life, but they're not really sure if it was God. They just are thankful something happened, and something happened, but they don't know what it was. Not even a person walking in doubt or unbelief. We're looking at a person who, if you said, May I introduce you to Jesus? Their eyes flash and they glare and they say, I hate God. Haters of God. Pretty strong stuff. Despiteful, proud, boasters. Now I want to share something with you and just stop right there for a moment because there's still more to this list. Here's this word boasters. This word boasters, I'm not going to give it to you in Strong's. If you want it, it's 213, but we don't need to go into all of that. It just simply means a boaster. You know what? Somebody brags, boasts a lot. This passage is used by denomination after denomination after denomination, pulled out of context to deny gay Christians the right of membership in the church. God hates homosexuals. Period. And we've seen it's not talking about homosexuals, right? It's the same passage that's used to deny, not only is it used to deny gay people a relationship, it's the one that uh, not too long ago, just last year in the news, when a Southern Baptist church said, well, you know, we realize that uh, we're telling gay people that, you know, they shouldn't be walking in fornication, and so here's two that will love one another and we want to bless and sanctify that so that they will at least be in relationship and not in fornication and when that church blessed that relationship that Southern Baptist Church was yanked out of the Southern Baptist Convention and thrown aside for having blessed love for having blessed love this is the passage that people say it they can therefore pull out funding we don't need to fund any studies or any further discussion or any group that wants to look within our denomination into scientific studies or anything else that God is doing or or that science can show us this this is the passage that they pull out and yet do they live by the same standard and throw out someone who's full of debate do they throw out a pastor who boasts And you know, I read Christian magazines all the time and I see these ads for conferences. And these ads for Christian conferences boast in such a way to say that if you don't make it to this conference, you're going to miss God. This is the only place, they imply, that God will ever speak to the body of Christ. And if you really are a Christian, you must be in this conference. Never mind that the next page says the very same thing for another conference a month later somewhere else in the country. And that the next page says the very same thing about another conference somewhere else in the country. You've got to get to Camp Meeting 93. Oh no, you've got to get to the move of God at the house of whatever over here in this city. Oh no, you can't miss this school of the prophets where God's anointed word will come forth. The only final word for the church today to walk in victory if you want to know anything that God is saying. Do we throw out those boasters? Well, why don't we? Well, they're not haters of God. Haters of God shaking their fist in his face they might be exaggerating a little bit and exaggerating quite a bit and God may not bless a thing they're doing but nonetheless you know why don't we walk by the same standard 
It's because we're blinded by tradition. The traditions of men make the word of God of none effect. And we're so blinded by hatred toward groups of people that we can't possibly see what God's really saying. Now, boasters, inventors of evil things. Look at this next word, disobedient to parents. Were any of us ever disobedient to our parents? <laughs> And these people are in trouble for that. And we don't repent and seek God and ask God's forgiveness for the times that we disobeyed our own parents. We don't repent and seek God for the time that we were boastful. We don't repent and seek God for the time that we were full of debate. But it's okay to get rid of every homosexual in the church. What's the matter with the church? If anything, we ought to look at this shopping list and look at our own life and take inventory and say, Father, have I done any of these things? Because it's obvious that the people who does these things, that the people who do these things, that person who does these things is the person who's walking with the author of lies. So when we're disobedient to parents, when we're full of envy, when we're full of debate, when we're full of covetousness, we're walking with the father of lies. And we don't look at this list and look at us and repent and say, Father, I'm sorry. The church just generally points a finger and says, look at what those homosexuals are like. This isn't homosexuals. These are heterosexuals who are walking in idolatry who've turned their back on the Father, who's not turned their back on them, until they got so far from his reach that he let go. Backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventor of evil things, disobedient to parents. No wonder verse 31 says they're without understanding. What do you expect by now? without understanding, covenant breakers. Now you know that means that if a husband and a wife get married, they're in a covenant, aren't they? This is a covenant breaker. They don't see anything wrong with breaking any covenant that they've made. They don't see anything wrong with divorce. They don't see anything wrong with fornication because they're filled with all fornication. So they don't see anything wrong with adultery. And it doesn't matter if this is a homosexual relationship or a heterosexual relationship. If they've made a covenant of love to a partner as a lifetime commitment, you can be sure that if this person is in that covenant, they will break it. You can't expect them to stay in the relationship because they are a covenant breaker. Sign their name on the dotted line. They'll file for chapter 13 just to get out of paying the debt. Their word's not any good. Nothing about their word is good. Without natural affection. You know, that's an interesting word. They talk about the natural affection that a mom has toward her child. Here's the mother who will just as easily take a cigarette and burn her daughter's arm, or who will find that child making too much noise and being inconvenient and drown them in the tub. They're full of all murder. No natural affection. Implacable, unmerciful, and who knowing the judgment of God that they which commit some such things are worthy of death, they not only do the same, but they have pleasure or they encourage those that do the same thing. Someone else does the same thing and they go, yeah, I'd do the same thing. I don't blame you. I don't blame you. I'd do it too. Yeah, right. Divorce the son of a gun. Kill the whatever. <laughs> You've heard that kind of language. Full of all wickedness. Well, what can you say here? They've got a reprobate mind, reprobate, unworthy. 
What does the believer have? The believer has the mind of Christ. Would you think that a person filled with all envy, filled with all deceit, a hater of God, an inventor of evil things, would have peace in their heart? Would you expect them to have peace of God that passes understanding? Would you expect them to? No. Therefore, the Bible's very clear. If you want to know if someone's a Christian, it doesn't say look at whether there's a homosexual. It says look at the fruit that's born in their life. You will know them by their fruit, Jesus says. And we know that the kingdom of God is righteousness. And the second thing that it is, is peace. The third thing it is, is joy in the Holy Ghost. Look at that second thing. A person who is born again will have peace. A person who's walking with all unrighteousness, filled with all wicked, filled with all wickedness, will have no peace. Because the Bible says there is no peace for the wicked. So the Bible says that. So they can't have peace because they don't know the Prince of Peace. So if we want to find out if the person being spoken about is someone like us. If it's you, if it's me, if it's someone that, uh, you know, we wonder about. The question is, do you have peace in your heart? Do you have peace in your life? There's a very important question. Very important. Colossians 3.15 says, You let the peace of God rule in your heart, to which you are called in one body, and be thankful. Well, a whole different attitude. You're thankful suddenly for the body of Christ instead of a debater. Instead of one who maligns everyone, full of debate, full of murder, full of maliciousness, full of envy, full of deceit, full of backbiting. Suddenly you're thankful for the body to which you are called. And you let the peace of God rule in your heart. So it doesn't matter if you're heterosexual or homosexual. What matters is if you belong to Jesus. And if you belong to Jesus, you will let peace rule. You will have the mind of Christ, not the mind of the enemy. You will be a lover of God, not a hater of God. You will be one who worships and serves the Creator rather than your own selfish self and Satan. Amen? That's right. So you look at this and you have to ask yourself, you know, no person is exempt from the Bible. No person is exempt from the Word of God. Ask yourself these questions. Look seriously at this Word and say, am I a hater of God? Have I hated God? Have I been at a place in my life where I shook my fist in the face of a holy God? If so, repent. Turn around. Don't walk with that. If you're the person who worships other things more than the creature, or the creator, I mean, more than the creator, find out, you know, where does my time and my energy and my love go? I've got an extra 20 minutes. What do I want to do with my extra free time? Do I want to worship the Lord or do I want to do this? What's the this? Repent. Because this should never take the place of God in your life. Suddenly you've got an extra 20 minutes. Why not grab the word and find out what God has to say? But these people don't want to retain the knowledge of God. They hate God. They'd never pick up a Bible. They'd never pick up his word. It says in Philippians 4, verses 6 to 7, Don't worry about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving. Let your requests be known to God. And in doing that, the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will keep your heart and it'll keep your mind through Christ Jesus. If we're going to walk with Him, there are benefits. Peace is one of them. Those folks have no peace. They have no shalom. They have no prince of peace. You have the opportunity to have that. 
So let's choose life, if we've chosen anything other than life. Let's choose Christ, the Prince of Peace, if we've ever chosen the enemy. We don't have to be these folks. We can be everything the Lord wants us to be. Would you join me in prayer, please? Father, I thank you for your word, and your word certainly is quick. It's alive. It's sharper than a double-edged sword. And I thank you that you reveal your truth in your word to show us who we are and who we can be. You also show us if we refuse to be who you want us to be, what we might be. But Lord, we want your best. And we thank you that you've provided it for us through the cross, through the blood, and in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Hallelujah. Amen. And amen. And he said, take hold of my covenant and I will be your God. Take hold of my covenant and with the angels trod. If you will keep my Sabbath and please me in your ways, I'll be your God and add unto and